ons skriflesing van morgen, um, is het Levitie, wel die vir achtergrond gaan ons lees uit Leviticus 23 vers 9 tot 11 en dan ook vers 15 tot 17 en dan we gaan dit vir ons in Afrikaans lees en dan um, ons tekstgedeelte vandag kom uit handelinge 2 uit, maar ons sal gaan dit vir ons in Engels lees. Kom ons kom voor die woord van die Heer en ons lees dit saam. Leviticus 23 vers 9 En dit is Mozes wat hier praat en hy sê En die Heer het met Mozes gesprek en gesê Spreek met die kinders van Israel en sê aan hulle As jylle in die land kom wat ek jylle gee en sy opbrengs oes Moet jylle die eersteling scherf of die eerste, die eerstes van jylle oes na die priester bring. En hy moet die gerf voor die aangezicht van die Heere beweeg, so dat jylle welgevallig kan wees. Die dag na die sabbat moet die priester dit beweeg. So dit is op die zondag. En dan vers 15, wanneer ons kom by die pinksterfeest, dan moet jylle tel van die dag na die sabbat, Van die dag af, as jylle die beweegoffer bring, sewe volle weke moet het wees. So dis van die zondag na die zondag, tot die dag na die sewende sabbat, moet jylle vijftig daad tel, dan moet jylle een nieuwe spijsoffer aan die Heere bring. Jylle moet uit jylle woonplekke twee beweegbrode bring, dit moet van twee tiendes van een eva fijnmeel wees, gesierd moet het gebak word, as eerstelinge, of as een eerstelingsoffer aan die Heere. Dit ter achtergrond. Um, as jylle, jylle kan laai na handelinge 2, en ek gaan vir ons lees van vers 1 tot 13. En ek gaan nou oorskakel na die Brits toe. So it's Acts chapter 2 from verse 1 to 13. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. <coughs> and divided tongues of, as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it, and how is it, that we hear each one of us in his own native language. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to the Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. Thus far the word of the Lord this morning. <coughs> if I were to ask you to write down your opinion of what the church is, what is it that you would write? If I were to ask you to give me a little paragraph and to describe the church for us, what would you write? The most so-called Protestant Christians today, the church is basically an irrelevant institution, a relic of the days when people still needed to be part of some intimate community. 
The church to them is somewhat useful, sometimes helpful, mostly uninspiring, and for sure low on the list when it comes to what is really essential in life. But the Bible gives us a very different picture. And it does not allow us to have such a low view of the church. <coughs> An important place to look in the Bible to see this picture that the Bible pictures for us is in the events that happened on that Pentecost Sunday. When the Holy Spirit appeared as fire to the apostles and then rested on them after which they spoke by the Spirit. And so I want us to look this morning at this picture so that each one of us would have a far deeper biblical perspective on this phenomenon that we call the church. The impression that we should walk away with on what happened is far more than a day that was just filled with strange miraculous events that we don't know how to describe. What must be impressed on our minds and our hearts is nothing less than the commencement or the beginnings of God's new creation in the church. What had begun seven weeks earlier with Christ's resurrection is what we should find continuing in the newness of the church at Pentecost. While the church of God's people has always existed since the days of Adam when believers trusted and called on the name of God, something new and final was now being set into motion. We could call it God's final act of the new creation. Now as background, we saw in Leviticus 23 that Pentecost, one of the three important agricultural feasts, also called the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of First Fruits. This Feast of Pentecost was a divinely instituted feast for the Jews, being directly connected and following exactly 49 days after the Sunday of the Passover. What you would notice is that on both of these Sundays, there were to be a grain offering made to the Lord. On the Sunday after the Passover, unleavened bread was to be used, and then seven weeks later, two loaves of leavened bread, called the first fruits. And so on this particular Pentecost Sunday, seven weeks after Jesus Christ had risen from the dead, after his resurrection, <coughs> we find the disciples of Jesus, along with everybody else in Jerusalem back and they're about to take part in this important agricultural feast. Now we should ask the question whether God had meant anything more by pouring out His Holy Spirit on this Pentecost Sunday. Was there any significance either to the Jews back then or to us? or perhaps to all of us, both Jews and Gentiles. Now we must remember that to the Jews, every ordinance of God, every ordinance that God had given to them was always deeply sacramental. What do I mean by that? Everything that God had given them had a real spiritual significance, both in the form, the outward forms, and its practices. Right from the beginning, from the two trees in the garden, to circumcision, to the whole sacrificial system, and to the keeping of the Sabbath, every outward sacramental form had along with it an inward reality of God's intimate intent and His presence and his oversight, everything poured into that ordinance that he had given. Pentecost had the same sacramental significance. Nothing was merely didactic. Nothing was merely to teach them. 
Nothing was merely symbolic. Nothing was merely figurative. And so offering the first fruits of your labors also had this true spiritual significance. It pointed to a deeper inward reality of hope and expectation of God's future blessing, even His eschatological blessing. <coughs> when God does plan from all, of, all eternity to give His Holy Spirit to the church on this very specific day, 49 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we should stop for a moment and take note of what God was doing. And that really is the key. On this particular Pentecost, it wasn't really people doing the offering of first fruits to God, was it? The real actor on this morning, this day, was Christ Himself bringing forth, as it were, the first fruits of His harvest, the first fruits of His new creational church. And that is the significance both to Jews and to the Gentile. That Pentecost day, that Sunday, was far more than just an agricultural feast. It was a new creational feast. It was planned and purposed from all eternity. Of His own will, He brought us forth by the word of His power, by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruit of His creatures, says James chapter 1, verse 18. So that we, who were first hope in Christ, might be to the praise of His glory, says Ephesians 1, verse 12. And so there are really three aspects this morning that I want to bring out from this day, this Sunday, this Pentecost Sunday. Three new creational dimensions to the church that does not belong to the old creation that is passing away. So the first of these aspects or these new creational dimensions relates to God's blessed presence descending onto His people. That mighty rushing wind that filled the entire house along with the tongues of fire appearing to and resting on each of the apostles, they should remind us of something. And they do. They remind us of God's presence descending onto Mount Sinai in fire. When God spoke to them from the fire, from the midst of the fire, says the text in Exodus 19. And again, Moses referring back to it in Deuteronomy 5 verse 4. But perhaps even better, it must also remind us of 2 Chronicles 7 verse 1 to 3, when God's presence came down in fire and filled the temple of Solomon or the house of the Lord, as it says in verse 2 there. It reminds us of God's presence coming down to dwell with His people. But the big difference at Pentecost is that God did not descend onto some geographical location or an architectural structure. Speaking from the midst of the fire. At Pentecost, the Spirit rested on people so that the Word went forth from those people. That is a big, big difference. The coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts presents us, therefore, not with God dwelling again in an architectural place as if God dwells in temples, but God coming down in people as His new creational temple. Now, if this sounds a little strange to you, it is probably because you've always thought of the church as figuratively related to the temple. But you probably have not thought of the church as the temple. 
But listen to how the Apostle Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16 to 17. Do you not know that you are God's temple and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy this one. For God's temple is holy, which you are. Or in chapter 6, verse 19, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? Or 2 Corinthians 6, verse 7, 16. And what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Not we are like the temple of the living God. We are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will live in them and will walk about among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. We are God's chosen dwelling place and so we will remain into eternity. And in your own time you can go and read Revelation 21 all the way from verse 1 to 22 and you will see that this is so also in that book of John. The church of God in the New Testament, what we do here, is therefore not like what they did in the temple. We are the temple. And if you want to use a figure of speech then, a better way to talk about it is to say that the tabernacle and Sinai and the temple of the Old Testament they were all like the church, not the other way around. They were all prefigures of the new creational temple, which Paul says we are. Now, if that is true, then the question that we must ask is, what does this mean to us? What does this mean to you? It means at least that you should not see the church in any way less holy or less glorious than the temple of Jerusalem and Solomon's temple in all its glory. In fact, you should have a far higher view of her for whom Christ died. Christ didn't die to save even one stone of that temple that was destroyed. But He did die and he did, he was raised from the dead that he might indwell us, whom he has set apart as holy for himself. Think about this Mount Sinai, the tabernacle, and Solomon's temple, they all served as God's chosen connection point between heaven and earth, between him and his people. It was at the temple or at the tabernacle that they could meet with God. But that was all part of this dying creation. The church is that connection as part of God's new creation. The church is part of God's new creation. Sinai today is deserted and the temple was destroyed. And there is no tabernacle. But Christ is building His church with whom He is united into eternity as our Lord. The church really is God's only chosen connection point between earth and heaven. But isn't that a marvelous thought? The church is God's only connection point, just like Sinai, or the temple, or the tabernacle. The church today is God's connection point between earth and heaven. What we do here every Sunday, and how we deal with one another during the week, it all has to do with what priests and worshippers did at the temple. But far more so, our worship, 
is in the spirit, in spirit and truth, as Jesus told the woman at the well. There is no make-believe here. There is no looking forward to real worship one day. All that we do in the liturgy, in the preaching, in the praying, in the singing, it is all very real and very significant. You can really think of it this way. At this very moment, we are worshiping our God in real time, just as the angels in heaven are worshiping Him. The second new creational aspect that began at Pentecost has to do with the power of God's Word to grow the church. In the first chapter in verse 8, Jesus had told the apostles that their witness, their witness, what they spoke, would ultimately reach the end of the earth. Pentecost was the first fruits of that promise. Now, if you go through the book of Acts, you will find that the phrase, the word of God, or the word of the Lord, occurs 21 times as it refers to this witness of the apostles going out. The witness about Christ. And what is more, that three times, three of those times, <coughs> we find this interesting phrase where it says that the word of God grew. It increased. The Greek word is the normal word for growth, oxano. And the word, as the word was growing, so also new souls were added to the church. It is a clear correlation. In chapter 6, verse 7, we read that the word of God continued to grow, to increase, and the number of the disciples will, were being multiplied greatly. In chapter 12, verse 24, the word of God increased and multiplied in contrast to Herod's words that condemned him in that moment he spoke. In chapter 19, verse 11 to 20, we read how the, those sons of Sceva, sons of the high priest, they tried to copycat Paul by invoking the name of Jesus. And then they failed miserably. Remember how they were running out naked, the demons chasing after them. Then it says that fear came over everyone so that many came confessing their practices. And Luke concluding in verse 20, So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. The very clear point is that as the word of God grew, so also did the church grow, either in souls being added to the church or in holiness. What this means is that the Word of God is what grows the church. The Word of God is what grows the church. The Word of God is what grows Christ's new creational church. The Apostle Paul says the same thing in Ephesians 2 verse 90 to 22. God's household is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure grows together into a holy temple, a dwelling place for God by his Spirit. There is a great consistency in the New Testament on this theme. There is something alive and active about the Word of God, isn't there? And it grows the holy people of God to become a more and more worthy dwelling place for Him by His Spirit. Brothers and sisters, the Word of God isn't merely something that the Reformation got stuck on disproportionately. The Word of God is what created the church, and the Word of God is what grows the church. Those 3,000 Jews at Pentecost weren't cut to the heart in chapter 2, verse 37, because they felt the rushing wind or because they saw the tongues of fire on the apostles' heads. 
They were changed because they received the word of Christ. When Paul told them that God had made the very, this very Jesus that they had crucified, God had made him both Lord and Christ. That is what cut them to the heart. So that they ask, what shall we do? If then it is the word of God that causes the new creational growth of Christ's church as God's temple. And if what we really care about is the new creation. Then it is of utmost importance to each one of us to make the word of God central to all that we do. Where we care about the new creation, there the Word of God runs everything. Conversely, it's also true, wherever the Word of God does not run everything, there we may be sure that we also have no care for the new creation. We have no care for eternity. Where the Word of God is not welcome, there is no church. Where the word of God is not welcome, there is no temple. There is no holiness. There is no true worship. This is true for households, for parents, for husbands, for wives, for every relationship that we are in. But it is especially true for pastors and elders who are all set over the church by Christ himself. Gregory Beale, the commentator, when he writes on this temple building theme in 1 Corinthians 3, he writes, Those who try to build people on the foundation of Christ without preaching and teaching God's word, God's true word, and his gospel, they will find that such people are like wood and hay and straw, and that their work will be burned up. Only the word of God can bring about gold and silver and precious stones that will survive the judgment of God. It's very easy to build with hay and stubble. You can build really quickly. It's much more difficult to find gold and silver and precious stones and build a temple with that. And yet that is what God will honor. At Pentecost, Christ began to build his new creational church through the word of God that pointed to him, Jesus, as Lord and Christ, the supreme ruler of all things and the only savior of the world, the only savior of sinners. This is the only formula the only program for how Jesus builds his church. This is the only way in which the church will prevail against the gates of hell. The third and final aspect of what Christ brought about at Pentecost is what we may call his new creational reversal of fortunes. That sounds very cryptic. It all has to do with what happened at the Tower of Babel or at Babel in Genesis 11. Actually, it goes all the way back to what God had commanded Adam and then again to Noah and his children after the flood. When he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Fill the earth. The problem at Babel <coughs> was that very clever men had a very different idea of what they would do. Remember how they came together to build for themselves a city and a tower so that they would not be dispersed over the face of all the earth? But then seeing the unlimited potential of such evil, God frustrated their unity by confusing their language. And he caused the very thing that they had feared. He dispersed them over the face 
of the earth. Now at Pentecost, that dispersion over the face of the earth was turned into a blessing. What was a dispersion across the face of the earth due to frustration, because they were all frustrated by their language and so they spread across the face of the earth, that became the vehicle for Christ to build His church among the nations and fill the earth with God's glory. Actually, there is another layer. I was thinking about that during the night while I was awake. God had dispersed hum humanity across the face of the earth. And then when Israel did not want to listen to God and they were disobedient, He dispersed them among those nations. And then at Pentecost, many of those came back to Jerusalem. And they were the devout men, these 3,000. And God was about to do something with them. Isn't it amazing that those men gathering at Pentecost, from every nation, it says, under heaven, they were devout men. Jews who had traveled to Jerusalem because they feared God. It is to them that the Spirit, through the apostles, spoke in the languages of the land to which they had been dispersed. Now, the Spirit could have, I guess, directly reversed what God had done at Babel. And He could have created one unified language for the church. But that is not what the Spirit did. A mere direct reversal would simply have undone the dispersion that God had created at Babel. And it would probably have allowed for that unstoppable evil to take over. History has shown us how evil can flourish when Hitler's and Stalin's unite only a few people behind them. Imagine the evil when you can unite the whole world behind you. But God's new creational reversal had in mind devout witnesses being sent to the ends of the earth. As we read in Acts 1 verse 8. In Genesis 18, God had dispersed the human race across the face of the earth. Pentecost was the first fruit of the harvest that Christ would have through His church among all of those people. This is the picture that we should have. Pentecost was the beginning of what Christ was doing in the world. To send true witnesses to send a true church, the true temple among all the nations so that he could gather in a harvest, not just first fruits. Christ's purpose was to have a harvest among the Gentiles through these 3,000 devoted Jews and many more, those who could speak to those Gentiles in their own language. <coughs> There is much to learn from what the Spirit did that day. <clears throat> well, for one, we know that God never just reverses things back the way it was. He's always using His wisdom to work His will in the midst of what is going on. In speaking to these men in their native language, and eventually saving them, they should have known that Jerusalem was never going to be their final destination. These men, when they were saved, when they were coming to Jerusalem, remember, they stayed in Jerusalem for a long time. They should have known that Jerusalem was never going to be their final destination. However glorious those initial days were. It tells us that growth to Christ is more than the size of our congregations. Growth to Christ is more than the size of our congregations. Of course, it includes that. It is even more than our own individual spiritual growth. It tells us that Christ is working 
to fill the earth with God's glory through His church. Christ is working to fill the earth with God's glory through His church. There is always an outward drive to the nations, to the end of the earth. As soon as we try to huddle together, even in the name of holiness and purity, we should know that we are working against God's purposes to fill the earth with His glory as the water covers the sea. Second point is that God isn't merely interested in filling the earth with ungodly people. That is clear from Scripture. The ungodly do not glorify God in spirit and truth. True worshipers are what the Spirit started creating that day. Men who were cut to the heart and called on the name of the Lord to be saved. As Joel says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It is such men that the Spirit created through the Word of God that very day. And it is such men that He eventually dispersed among the nations from which they came. Let me ask you, are you merely a babbler, someone from Babel, and you're merely frustrated with people of other cultures and ethnicities and languages? Are you merely dispersed on the face of the earth without any sense of why you are here? Or have you bought into this new creational reversal? You understand that you are called to be a light to the Gentiles, to the ungodly, to every creature. You are a true worshiper sent to the people of your native language. To understand this is to understand the new creational church for whom Jesus had died. Let me sum all of this up for us. The church isn't merely the church. It's not merely people trying to build a little huddle for themselves with a little tower that they think can reach into heaven. <coughs> the church is God coming down through His Spirit to do something new creational. Something that is everlasting. Something, as Hebrews 12 says, cannot be shaken. Something that only has a beginning, it does not have an end. The church is God's new creational temple in which He dwells with His people and in which they worship and glorify Him. It is in and through the church that the Word of God cuts open the hearts of sinners so that they confess Jesus as Lord and Christ. And this church is God's very vehicle to fill the face of the earth with true worshipers who glorify God from every nation under heaven. I asked you in the beginning of the sermon what you would write down if I ask you what is your opinion of the church. We should tremble at the church because it is the very fingerprints of God. The church is God's final act through His Son before that great feast of ingathering at the end of time. The church, what we are, is God's final ingathering. And there will be a feast at the end of this. That is how each one of us should think of the church. The church is the beginning of the new creation, Christ's new creation. 